This is the sixth septenary of the Arbital of Magic. Aphorism 36. When conducting experiments, it is important to avoid mixing them and instead focus on keeping each one simple and independent. Both God and nature have designed each experiment with a specific purpose in mind. For instance, those who use simple herbs and roots for healing tend to have better success. Similarly, various elements like constellations, names, characters, and stones possess hidden virtues and influences that may seem miraculous. Likewise, certain sayings have the power to command immediate obedience from visible and invisible creatures, whether they belong to our world, such as water, air, or underground, or to the higher realms like Olympus, the celestial sphere, the underworld, and even the divine. Therefore, it is important to seek simplicity in our pursuits and seek divine knowledge of the fundamental truths. The remaining knowledge can only be obtained through experimentation. Experiments meaning magical operations, spells, whatever you call them. And we always talk about this, even outside of this context of this course, that you don't get success in your magic by throwing everything but the kitchen sink at your goal or your objective. Do one thing at a time. Otherwise, you don't know how to troubleshoot it. You don't know whether it worked. You don't know whether it didn't work. If it did work, you don't know why it worked or how it worked because you had so many things going. And more frequently than that, nothing works because you've got so many things going. And so sometimes one thing cancels out another. It's all chaotic. So keep it simple. Keep it streamlined. Aphorism 37. Each entity has its designated place, the order, character or essence, and mode. This facilitates the understanding of both visible and invisible creatures. Order dictates that some creatures are of light, while others are of darkness. Those belonging to darkness have fallen into vanity, immersing themselves in darkness and facing eternal punishment for rebelling against grace. Their dominion encompasses both beautiful and transient things and vile and abhorrent aspects. It is a realm teeming with shameful crimes, sins, idolatry, blasphemy, disobedience, incitement, murder, tyranny, adultery, theft, lies, perjury, and lust for power. This amalgamation forms the kingdom of darkness. On the other hand, creatures of light embody eternal truths and God's grace. They hold dominion over the entire world and, as parts of Christ, possess authority over the forces of darkness. These two factions will continue to battle until God ultimately ends the strife at the last judgment. Aphorism 37 has a lot of very old school biblical ideas in there. And if you look at these ideas from a more Luciferian perspective, they make a lot more sense. If we look at the fact that Lucifer is the light bearer, everything that light comes into contact with that's not light is destroyed immediately. So when it talks about the creatures belonging to the order of darkness, they've fallen into vanity, and that was symbolized by the fall of that light. When you fall into vanity, you immerse yourself into darkness and you face eternal punishment because of the rebelling against grace. Now, what eternal punishment means is any time that you are experiencing these so-called sins— idolatry, blasphemy, disobedience, incitement, murder, tyranny, adultery, blah, 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 blah. The present moment is where eternity lies. You are eternally in that torment that those sins cause you. Like the the fire is hot and you put your hand on the fire, it burns. That punishment, that torment is eternal, meaning in the present moment, until it's corrected. And that's what the last judgment is. The last judgment is simply a sorting out process. This is real. This is false. This is real. This is false. And therefore, everything that the light from that light bearer illumines makes the illusions of darkness disappear. It's not something that's going to happen in time. It's talking about a process that happens at all times. So in the present moment, what it's calling creatures of darkness, it's what the ego makes of the present moment. And so that's eternal torment. 
But when our present moment becomes ensconced in light, then it dispels that darkness, and that's what the last judgment is. And that's something that happens for us now. We don't have to wait for some other day for that to happen. Then it says, on the other hand, the creatures of light hold dominion over the entire world, and as parts of Christ, possess authority over the forces of darkness. So, you are a part of Christ in that we are all one with the one body of the child of God, right? The first occurrence of that, according to Luciferian doctrine, was Lucifer, because that was the first born, that was the first created. Now, God didn't create an ego, but God did create Lucifer. Lucifer's fall created the ego, which caused those things of darkness. But then Lucifer's light also is that which dispels the darkness. That's what redemption is, or what we call restitution. So we are all restored once we accept the light. Aphorism 38. Thus the first division of magic is twofold. One way is bestowed by God to the beings of light. Similarly, the other way is also from God, but given to the creatures of darkness. The latter is also twofold. Firstly, is when the princes of darkness are compelled to do good to the creatures through God's power. The other is toward an evil end, when God punishes the wicked by allowing them to be deceived and ruined by magic. The second division of magic accomplishes its effect using visible tools through the invisible. Another way is with invisible tools through the invisible. And yet another way is a combination of techniques and tools. The third division is solely accomplished by invoking God. This includes both prophetic and philosophical aspects, such as theophrastic, which is also known as the wise way. Alternatively, in ignorance of the true God, it is accomplished through the princes of the spirits to achieve their purpose. This is the work of the mercurialists. That's also known as an alchemist. The fourth division is the magic that comes from the highest God through his good angels, who exercise their magic in place of God. This is the magic of the Balim, and the Balim are are probably the magicians of Baal. Another type of magic is performed through the governors of the evil spirits. This is the magic performed through the minor gods of the pagans. The fifth division is when some are capable of dealing directly with the spirits in person, face to face, but this ability is only given to a few. Others work through dreams or other signs such as divinations and sacrifices of the ancients. The sixth Division is when some work through immortal creatures and others work through magical creatures such as nymphs, satyrs, and similar inhabitants of the elements like pygmies. The seventh division is when spirits voluntarily serve some individuals without any special art, while they barely obey others even when evoked according to the art. Among all of these categories of magic, the most excellent is the one that solely relies on God. The second is the magic practiced by those whom the spirits faithfully serve. The third belongs to Christians through the power of Christ, which he possesses in heaven on earth. So, this is a lot to unpack here, but let's just do it as quickly as we can. You can find a lot more just by meditating on it yourself as well. The first division of magic being twofold One is bestowed by God to the beings of light, which we already described. The other one is bestowed by God to the beings of darkness, which cause punishment. God has bestowed the law of cause and effect onto all things. And so, if you do something that causes you to get a reward, it's built into the thing. If you do something that causes you punishment, That's also built into the thing. So that's why we say evil destroys itself, because it eventually consumes itself. The second division accomplishes its effect using visible tools through the invisible. In our witch's primer, we have all the tools. They are there for a specific reason. Those are physical representations of invisible principles that we use in order to keep our minds focused so that we can do our operations in the invisible world. The third division is solely accomplished by invoking God. This includes both prophetic and philosophical aspects. We talked about that, I think, on two septenaries ago, that a lot of this you don't even need. If you are able to just learn the basic principles of occult prayer, you can ask for what you need and get it. 
based on just doing nothing but invoking infinite intelligence. That can be tricky for a lot of people because many people's minds are not disciplined and trained enough, so they need to go through other kinds of machinations, which is fine. The fourth division is the magic that comes from the highest God through his good angels who exercise their magic in place of God. That means if you're not at a place where you can directly interact with infinite intelligence and keep your mind focused, that's okay because infinite intelligence has angels in place that can do it for you. They can do it for you. If you can't keep your mind clear and decide for God in a situation, let's say you had a healing that needed to happen. If you could decide for God completely in regards to that situation, the healing would have to happen. But if your mind is not strong enough to do that, there is an angel that can make that decision for you on your behalf and decide for God for you. And then it talks about some different kinds of magic through the history, the magic of the Balim, probably the culture that just predated the ancient Hebraic culture. Another type of magic is performed through the governors of the evil spirits. So even the evil spirits can do good work for you as long as you realize that God's ultimately in charge. You can get at any situation or any necessary magical operation from very far away from God if you are willing to keep your faith and your trust in infinite intelligence. Anything can work. The idea that God can use anything for your benefit should not make you feel scared. It should make you feel good. It should make you feel more secure that if this doesn't work, there's another way. If this doesn't work, there's another way. Even if I'm really far away from my own understanding of what goodness is, there's a lifeline in there that can pull me through. And then it goes through a fifth division that are capable of dealing directly with spirits and another one where you're dealing with divinations and dreams, sacrifices of the ancients. Again, God can use whatever it means that make the most sense to you. Working directly with the elementals, immortal creatures, those are just other ways that you can get the help that you need, even if you don't feel like you are at a place in your consciousness where you're elevated enough to speak directly to an angel or speak directly to God itself. You can always work with an elemental spirit. Now, the problem with that is the farther away from source you get, the easier it is for you to get distracted and to delay and to build up a bunch of nonsense for yourself, which eventually will have to get burned away, uh, which it talked about earlier. So the longer that you dally in darkness, the more you're going to have to have that darkness destroyed in order for you to get the resolution of what you want. But no matter where you are, In consciousness, there is always a way out. And so all you have to do is start an operation. Keep it simple. Do your best. Go with what you understand and go from there, knowing with faith that no matter what you do, as long as you are sincere about your desire, whatever methods you use will eventually get you what you need. But if you follow the aphorisms, it's telling you here also that you can streamline things and get to where you need to be without a lot of the trouble that going through some of these other methods may cause you. Aphorism 39. This is, I think, one of the most important aphorisms. This defines what a magus is. So if this is a path, not necessarily the Arbitel path, but if magic as a way of life is something that you're interested in, no matter what your tradition is, this is really a definition of what you need to do to get there. And we'll talk about this after we're done reading it. To learn the art of magic, there are seven essential steps to follow. 1. Reflect on how to attain true knowledge of God, understanding the universe's creation through self-contemplation. 2. Self-reflection is crucial, distinguishing between mortal and immortal aspects as well as what belongs to oneself versus what is foreign. 3. Contemplate the immortal soul, worship, love, and fear of the eternal God with sincerity and truth. Let the awareness of mortality guide actions that please God and benefit others. These are the three fundamental principles of magic, laying the foundation for true magic or divine wisdom. By following them, one may even be worthy of angelic creatures' visible and direct assistance. 4. Recognize one's destined position in life and discern if born for magic, studying relevant texts and testing experiments. 
5. Determine if able to perceive spirits' assistance in significant endeavors, which indicates being ordained as a magus. Be aware of common pitfalls such as inattention, ignorance, scorn, excessive superstition, ingratitude towards God, and failure to honor Him. 6. Possess faith and discretion respecting the Spirit's secrets that should not be revealed, as exemplified by Daniel and Paul in their visions and revelations. 7. Uphold the highest degree of justice, abstaining from supporting anything wicked, unfair, or unjust, safeguarding against evil. By following these steps, one can embark on the path of becoming a magus. So the first three are the ones they say here are the most important. So reflect on how to attain true knowledge of God, understanding the universe's creation through contemplation. So just really contemplating the vastness of the universe, the infinity of infinite intelligence, how infinite that intelligence is. And the second one is self-reflection, distinguishing between mortal and immortal aspects, as well as what belongs to oneself versus what is foreign. Understanding that a lot of our ego impulses are not of us. There are things that we picked up along the way. There's a lot that we picked up along the way in this life that we just assume is how we are and who we are. And this is a very important part of becoming a magus, it's saying, is to be able to reflect and say, yeah, this is what infinite intelligence created. This, not so much. And even though you may not always be able to purify the things that are foreign to who you are as a soul, you can still identify them. Contemplate the immortal soul, worship, love, and fear of the eternal God with sincerity and truth. Let the awareness of mortality guide actions that please God and benefit others. Allowing our actions to be informed by our understanding of who we are as souls. Your true will is what your soul wills as it emanates, as it is projected, as it is extended from source. That's how important you are. And so, really understanding that and contemplating on who you are as a soul and letting that guide your actions, boy, then all of a sudden you start getting very (laughs) majesty and you start becoming very powerful. Okay, and then the the final four of this, recognizing one's destined position in life and discern if born for magic. You know, if you're really drawn to magic, you need to honor that and understand what that is and where that's coming from. If you're drawn to being a magus, then you probably are supposed to be one. Just the desire alone is not enough, but it can be what propels you, especially through a lot of times where it's really easy to give up because it seems so hard. But if you desire magic as your way of life, you're going to have what it takes to get through those tough times. And so it's really important to really be in touch with that burning desire. Determine if you're able to perceive spirit's assistance in significant endeavors. That indicates being ordained as a magist. It's not enough to ask for help. You've got to determine when you've been helped. Anybody can ask for help, but very few people actually say, oh, it worked. And this is how it worked and how grateful you are that it worked. Being willing to honor and give gratitude and praise for infinite intelligence working through you. And if you, because if you're not willing to do that, then all of it's really for nothing. You won't really have success that is repeatable. But if you can live in that praise, if you can live in that gratitude, if you can live in that acknowledgement of how successful magic is for you, then you're unstoppable. Possess faith and discretion respecting spirit secrets that should not be revealed. Learning that you need to keep your mouth shut. Not only about some esoteric secret that Spirit revealed to you, but the fact that you're even working with them, that you are working on a particular goal, that you're working on an objective. Keep that secret. Keep that under wraps. Secrecy means sacredness in magic. It doesn't mean sickness. Ego's secrets are sick. Whatever you attempt to keep secret, you give it power and you try to make it sacred. So if you're keeping sacred secrets, they are going to take care of you. If you are keeping sick secrets, they are going to destroy you. Uphold the highest degree of justice, abstaining from supporting anything wicked, unfair, unjust, or safeguarding against evil. Understanding what's right 
and doing it just because it's the right thing to do. That's an important part of being a magus, doing what is right regardless of what is easy. Aphorism 40, when perceiving spiritual beings, whether through the senses or internally, it is important to follow these seven laws for the practice of magic. I'm going to take these as we go, because it'll save a little time. 1. Understand that such spirit is assigned by God, and be mindful that God observes your actions and thoughts. Therefore, let your life be guided by the teachings of God's Word. So, all spirits that we work with are assigned by infinite intelligence. And if we understand that, we can allow ourselves to be guided, not only by when it says God's Word, that doesn't necessarily mean reading the Bible, but being guided in the moment about what to do and how to go and where to be. That's so important. That's like the crux of all magic, is not only doing a spell, but being guided as to how to respond in situations so that that spell can come about. Always pray with David's words, do not take your Holy Spirit from me and strengthen me with perfect spirit. Also pray to be protected from temptation and evil, just as Ahab was led astray. Instead, seek God's truth and guidance. So what that means is that you just take it for granted that the ego is always going to be trying to get you to go away from what is good. Not because the ego is anything real, but because it's a program. It's a program in our mind to self-destruct that we all fell into. But we have the ability to fall out of that just as easily. But we have to be vigilant and not allow ourselves to go on autopilot. And we just ask moment by moment by moment, what's the right thing? What's the right thing? What's the right thing? And then we follow as we're led. Test the spirits as scripture teaches. Just as grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, we must evaluate and embrace what is good and aligns with the divine will while rejecting what is incompatible. So just because you come up with a bright idea doesn't mean it came from one of the spirits of God. It could have come from what it's calling a dark spirit or what we call your ego, those thoughts that are all about self-destruction. And it's really easy for you to test them out. Which one makes logical sense from the point of view of infinite intelligence? Does it make you peaceful? Does it feel right? Is it good for all? Is it easy and relaxed? Is it healthy and positive? Or is it something that is making you churn? It's very easy to test the spirits. You, you don't need to rationalize infinite intelligence. You often need to rationalize the behavior of the ego. Avoid all forms of superstition. Do not attribute divine qualities to things that are unrelated to divinity, and do not create or follow worship practices that God has not commanded. This includes the magic ceremonies of Satan, who seeks to be worshipped as God. Satan seeking to be worshipped as God is not a term that I would use because Satan isn't that for me, that, that word Satan. I would say the ego. Satan in the Psalms actually works for God actually works for God. It's like a prosecutor for God. So I I don't agree with that terminology, but I understand where they're coming from because it came from that time period where Satan was responsible for everything bad. But the ego mind is about turning against that which is good for us. So the magic ceremonies of Satan simply is anything that is going to increase your illusion here. It doesn't necessarily even have to be a formal magic ceremony, but if you're involved with anything that is going to create more illusion and more confusion for you, you need to avoid it. That's why it's fine to use a crystal to focus your energy and even have that crystal or stone be in correspondence with a a particular power on the tree of life. That's fine. That's just putting things in alignment in your mind so that your mind can work the magic better. But to believe that the crystal has some sort of extra power that can do something for you, rather than realizing that God does that thing for you, that's the problem. And that just that little bit of a difference in your mind starts to get you confused and starts to make you believe that the things of this world have more power than God. And that's not going to help you, because all that does is make you feel vulnerable rather than make you feel powerful. Do not worship idols. Do not attribute divine power to idols or to other things that were not placed there by the Creator or by the course of nature, as some practitioners of black magic may imagine. Of course, you don't want to worship as your Creator 
some false deity or whatever. That makes sense. But really, it's much more practical than that. Idols in this culture are things like money, cars, relationships, jobs, clothes, positions of power. Those things in and of themselves are not bad. They're fine. In fact, God can give you those things. But to make those things more important than God is worshiping them. Once you understand that those things can happen for you, if, if they're good for you, as a result of infinite intelligence, but they are not infinite intelligence. So you don't want to put your desires for things before your desires for God. Avoid falling for the tricks of the devil who tries to imitate the creation and the power of the creator. The ability to create belongs only to the Almighty God and cannot be shared. Actually, I disagree with the way this is worded. God does share God's ability to create with you. That's the whole point. That's how you're a magus. That's how you're a soul. You do have the ability to create like God because God did share that power with you. What it's talking about here, that it, it didn't share the power with the ego, the reason why is because the ego doesn't exist. The ego doesn't exist. That's something we made up. We made up this false god that that is there to separate us, that is there to make us feel vulnerable, that is there to self-destruct. Those kinds of ideas or goals did not come from God. And so, falling for the tricks of the devil is that the illness of the ego mind is baffling. It is cunning. It is sly. And it will always try to to tempt you into going against your own self-interests. But once you recognize that for what it is, it's, it's actually very easy for you to see when it's your ego and when it's spirit prompting you, because spirit's always building you up. Spirit's always making you feel safe. Spirit's always making you feel certain about who you are in relationship to your creator, whereas the ego is always making you feel scared and wanting to separate and wanting to isolate. Embrace the gifts of God and the Holy Spirit to fully understand and improve our hearts and abilities. So, infinite intelligence's gifts to you are creativity, are happiness, are joy, are the realization of your heart's desires. So, if you embrace those things, you will be happy. If you embrace your fears, if you embrace your grievances, if you embrace the things that separate you, then all you get is more fear. And see, that power of decision is squarely on your own shoulders, and that gives you all the power. You have all the power to decide. Infinite intelligence gave you that power gave you the power of decision. His infinite intelligence didn't say, you must decide right. You must do it my way. No. Infinite intelligence said, oh, you want an ego? Well, that's your right. If that's really what you want, you can do that. But I'm still here to help you. I'm still here to lead you out of the darkness that you've created for yourself. But you still have to decide for that. And if you don't think you can decide for that, fine, I've got angels for you. I've got spirits for you. I've got as many helpers to help you combat the darkness that you're creating that you can imagine. There's no way that your ego can outsmart spirit. Spirit is never stumped. No matter what, there's always a way out. And that should make you feel really good. Aphorism 41. Now we reach the final nine aphorisms of this book, which will bring our whole overview of magic to a close with the help and mercy of the divine. Firstly, let us clarify what we mean by the term magus in this work. For us, a magus is someone who, through divine grace, gains knowledge of the entire world and nature, whether visible or invisible, by being served by spiritual essences. This definition of a magus is broad and universal. A cockomagus, on the other hand, is someone whom God permits evil spirits to serve, leading to their temporal and eternal ruin. They bewitch people and turn them away from God. An example of such a cockomagus is Simon the Magus, mentioned in the Acts of Apostles and by Clement. At the command of the divine, Peter, 
Simon was thrown down from the air where he had been elevated as a god by the unclean spirits. The twelve tables of the law contain references to various criminal uses of magic falling into this category. We will discuss each type and subdivision of magic in more detail in the following volumes. For now, it is sufficient to distinguish between good and evil sciences. It is worth noting that when the first man sought the knowledge of both, it led to his ruin— as explained by Moses and Hermes. That's in Genesis. That's what it's saying, explained by Moses. And by Hermes, you can read the divine Poimandris, and you can understand how Hermes explained that that fall from grace. When it's talking about the 12 tables of the law, it's uh, talking about Roman law. There was actually laws on the books in Rome forbidding certain types of magic that were malefic and attack-type magic. It's talking about how it's important to understand how much of this negative magic works so that you understand what it is, but not necessarily that you should participate in it. Even more than that, in your day-to-day life, you want to make sure, am I being a magus or a cockamagus? And you can think of cockamagus as like cockamamie. Like, am I doing something cockamamie? Am I off the path? Or am I actually on the path of my wisdom? Is this the right decision or not the right decision? And constantly asking yourself, regardless of whether you are in the midst of a magical operation, that is the way of the magist. That is a real wizard's way or witch's way, whatever you want to call it, whatever terms you enjoy. That is walking the way of wisdom where every day, in every way, you really are getting better and better. Whereas the other way where you're constantly indulging in that which separates you from infinite intelligence and from what they would call in this particular writing the body of Christ, which basically just means your own place in the cosmos, your star's course as a soul. When you're not doing that, when you are not fulfilling your true will, then you are you're setting yourself up for what it calls eternal punishment, but what we understand eternal punishment to mean in the present moment. Remember that the the fire being hot is sufficient to cause the punishment of the burned hand. And then finally, aphorism 42. Secondly, it is important to understand that a magus is someone who is destined for this kind of work from birth. We should not embark on such a great endeavor unless we are divinely called, either for a good purpose by grace, or by an evil purpose. As mentioned in the scripture, things that cause people to sin are bound to come, but woe to that person through whom they come. Therefore, as we have emphasized before, we must live in this world with a sense of fear and caution. I will not deny that with the study and diligence, some individuals may achieve certain levels of success in different types of magic if permitted. However, they will never be able to attain the highest levels. On the contrary, if one seeks these levels without a doubt, it will result in harm to both the body and the soul. And those who are transported by the operations of the Kakomagi to Mount Horeb or the wilderness often suffer injury are torn apart or ultimately lose their sanity. These things often occur when individuals forsake God and are delivered to Satan. Again, this is speaking to the tendency of the ego towards self-destruction. And so when we are constantly questioning ourselves, allowing ourselves to be guided and led, rather than making up our own mind about how we are going to orient ourselves when we're working magic or when we're doing anything for that matter then we can be sure that we are asking to be guided and led, that we are always going to be on the right path to where we are obtaining our soul's will. If we are allowing ourselves to move into self-destructive patterns, then we have a lot of problems ahead of us. So the choice is always our own. And that's it for this septenary. Thank you so much for spending some time with me. Until next time, blessed be. Blessed be.